Um, let me start with the usual caveat. Our institute is very closely associated with the Belgian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And our ambassador is present here, but it's not a part of the ministry, so I'm not obliged to give you any official Belgian uh, point of view, vice versa. The ministry is not obliged to uh, accept any of my brilliant recommendations, but <laughs> that's an arrangement that the two parties uh, seem to be able to live with. Um, this debate about strategy has just become um, topical again um, because there is an initiative by four member states, Sweden in the lead, uh, it is said with Poland, Italy and Spain, to, they have tasked their national institutes, like the institute here, um, to start a reflection about what they call a European global strategy, just to end with a report uh, sometime in the spring of next year, uh, which no doubt the four member states will try to use to further the idea of adopting a formal new strategic document at the EU level. Um, they tried to, uh, last year, they, they proposed uh, the more or less the same countries to revise the actual, the existing European security strategy, which now goes back to 2003. But um, they didn't really manage to convince enough other capitals. About three or four member states were explicitly in favor. About three or four member states were explicitly against, against and the rest didn't really seem to care that much, a result of which uh, the debate ended in a stalemate. And I think this is sort of a new attempt to have the same debate under a different name. Should we not need more European strategy. Um, the usual three points in my speech, all the great speeches have three parts. First of all, um, why do I think that indeed we need some more strategy? Um, my own very self-interested reason is of course that means I can write yet another book about this fascinating um, topic, but there are more objective reasons too. I mean, in the European security strategy, I think um, we have a document that operates at the, what I would call the grand strategic level. Thereby I mean that, uh, contrary to what its name suggests, it's not just about security policy, it's actually about foreign policy or EU external action. Um, but it's not a complete document. I think it's a document that mostly sort of codifies how the EU likes to do things, a sort of preferred methodology. We like to be preventive about things, we like to do things in a multilateral setting, and we like to be holistic or comprehensive. Um, that tells us how to do things, doesn't really tell us what to do, what are actually EU objectives, what are the priorities of EU foreign policy, and especially after the Lisbon Treaty came into force and we created this whole new machinery, our own external action service, a much strengthened position of the high representative, the question then you know, soon became, well, what are they here for? What are they, what are they supposed to do? And to that, existing strategies don't really provide an answer. As a result of which the EU, I think, all too often tends to be quite quite reactive. And of course, foreign policy is often about reacting to what goes on, um, but that doesn't exclude that at the same time one should try to proactively shape certain events and developments in areas in which one is very interested. And that, of course, uh, means that one has to define some priorities beforehand. Um, at the same time, as you all know, we're living in an increasingly multipolar world, meaning there are more and more actors that have global reach, which tend to be much more proactive. Uh, I think the Chinese, to name just the obvious example, have a much better idea for themselves of what their interests are and what their objectives are. It doesn't mean they're always successful in pursuing them, but it does mean that they pursue them much more uh, determinately than the EU, which often is a bit you know, wishy-washy. What do we want? Do we want something? Uh, and as a result, we easily get played off the field. I always quote my colleague, Joe Coulmont, who said, you know, at the global uh, stage, uh, the, all the, many of the other actors, they seem to be playing chess. Uh, and the EU is stuck playing ping pong, um, <laughs> rather less sophisticated, I, I dare to argue. Um, finally, I think in, in the recent years we have been confronted with some events, some developments um, that have an impact at the whole of EU foreign policy and therefore demand a debate at this grand strategic level. Uh, there's the Arab Spring, which in, uh, brings enormous geopolitical change in our immediate periphery. There's the so-called American pivot to the Asia-Pacific, but also to the greater Middle East, but which does mean that you know, uh, the US expects every European to do its duty, to take care of our own security problems. And there's, of course, the financial crisis, which means that we have less means available um, for foreign policy. It also means we have lost a lot of soft power, I would argue, and a lot of, of prestige and leverage in the rest of the world. 
those, those three factors have an impact on everything that the EU does in terms of foreign policy, and therefore you cannot just discuss them, I think, within the box of one specific policy field. Um, you cannot just talk about the Arab Spring within the box of the European neighborhood policy, because, uh, well, for one, there are linkages with, with, with regions that are outside the European neighborhood policy. Think about the Sahel, think about the Gulf area and actors like Saudi Arabia. Um, for another thing, we might the, the, we might want to decide that because our periphery is so important to us that we want to shift means from one policy area to the neighborhood policy area, or we want other strands of foreign policy, think about development, to refocus on the neighborhood. I put this just as an example. So in my view, we need a debate about at this grand strategic level of the whole of EU foreign policy sets some priorities. Um, and this has been difficult. There is not great willingness to undertake this. And it seems to me that very often we confuse a bit the question of substance with the question of formalities. The official debate, yet again at the, the Gimlich in March, always tends to focus on form and process. People seem to be you know, stuck up about, yes, but who will write it? And who, uh, will we be able to have a small drafting team? And what's the role of a document like this? And in which way should we write it down? And nobody really seems to talk about the question, what should this, our strategy actually be? You know, and whether we write it down or in what form is then, in my view, the second question. But the first question, what should our strategy strategy B tends to be a bit overlooked. Um, so I'm hopeful that um, this new initiative of the four countries, um, at least, you know, it's another attempt to get the strategic debate into, uh, into gear. So we need, in my view, a new, um, a really substantial debate on, on strategy. Um, what should that strategy what should our strategy be in the second part of my talk? Let me just briefly touch upon a couple of dimensions that I think require uh, much more attention. One is obviously the neighborhood policy. Uh, and I've been saying this since before the Arab Spring, but it's all the more valid, all the more valid now. We haven't really reassessed our policy towards our southern neighbors since the Arab Spring. You know, we have shifted a few means, 5% of the budget around from the left to the right or from the right to the left, I'm not quite sure, but we're basically doing uh, more of the same. And indeed, the program is called More for More. I would say it's you know, more of more rather than more for more. I'm not saying that um, this is not useful, but I'm not sure it is quite quite sufficient. Uh, you're seeing enormous changes there. You see, you know, within all of our neighbors, uh, we see new actors coming to the fore. We see new alignments arising among our neighboring countries, and we see a new role for certain outside uh, actors. Um, the risk, I think, is that many of these actors now look away from Europe. Now, we don't want these actors to look up to us. That's not what we are there for. We're not about to, to craft a sphere of influence, I would say. Um, but we would hope that they want to um, look towards Europe and, and regard us as partners. Of course, our legitimacy is quite low now because many of the regimes that uh, there were the, the, where there have been revolutions that have been, have been brought down were until that very day are, are, are supposedly our friends and allies. Uh, and it's a bit difficult to go to Tunisia and say, okay, we, report, we support the local dictator for 50 years, but now we'll explain you how to do democracy. If I were Tunisia, I would say, merci beaucoup, but perhaps I can sort it out myself. Um, but, but there are... Um, but we do need partnership with these countries because of vital interests that are at stake in the region. Think about energy, think about migration, um, think also about economic interest in the region per se. There are also opportunities. Um, we are perhaps a little too worried about the fact that, um, that, that political Islam comes to power. That doesn't need to be negative. Um, the president of the European Council is a member of a religious party, the Flemish Christian Democrat Party. Uh, if that is not a problem in Europe, we should not automatically assume that the religious party outside Europe is a bad thing. And if you look at the recent utterings of the president of Egypt, it is clear he is not 100% uh, in, in, for example, the Iranian camp, if you look at the speeches he gave there. So I would expect some much more you know, proactive initiative by the EU in seeking out new partners and seeking out new alliances. And of course, there's the ongoing conflict in Syria, and there is that is there, that we have some sort of new uh, region-wide Sunni-Shia confrontation. I don't think, for example, that it's up to the EU to pick sides in this confrontation. I think it rather should be our role to, to get arrive at a situation in which all regional actors uh, can, find, can find themselves. So obviously, lots of questions there. Second issue, um, our position in the multipolar world. 
Um, strategic partnerships are supposedly one of our priorities, always repeated. Uh, we have about uh, 10 of them now with, with most of the key global, global players, United States obviously, the BRICS countries, um, some, of, you know, some countries from nobody is quite clear why they are a strategic partner, like, like Mexico. Um, with many of these we have a strategic dialogue, I think, we can talk about everything, but we don't really do a lot together necessarily. And for me, partnership is more than dialogue, it means joint, uh, joint action. So how to give substance um, to those partnerships? It seems to me that all too often we regard those as instruments to further the bilateral relations. And they are of course that, but not just that. that we should also look at them horizontally and use them in function of our um, predefined horizontal foreign policy interests. Try to make coalitions and, and issue areas, you know, constant. perhaps on, on issue one we can agree with the Chinese and the Indians to act together. Another issue will be with the Brazilians and the, and the Indians, but try to find more joint action. Uh, that is, of course, difficult because many of our st uh, strategic partners start from a very different value system. Just think about China, but it's not impossible, you know, we can combat piracy together with the Chinese. Is that a one-off thing or is there scope for more? Big debate there. Finally, I'm being very brief here, but I'll try to keep to my time, um, peace and security. Um, what is actually the EU's ambition as a global security provider? For me, the operation in Libya demonstrated once again that collectively we have no idea whatsoever of which regions or which types of contingencies we as Europeans feel responsible for. Uh, and as a result, our, uh, our responses are always um, ad hoc. And improvised. Clearly, Libya demonstrates what we already knew, that there is not enough Europe in security and defense. But Libya also uh, again made clear that there is likely to be less America in European security and defense in the future. The Americans keep on signaling uh, we would like you to take care of problems like these on your own. You are the first-line responder and you should acquire the capabilities to do that. Um, this requires a collective European response because the capabilities that we need to borrow from the Americans are the most capital intensive ones which no single EU member state um, can acquire on its own. Um, it's not, not France by itself or, or not, it's not even the Franco-British uh, alliance, the defense agreement that will acquire an air to air refueling capacity or, or the, all the satellite capacity that you need to do modern military operations. So the only possible reply is a collective reply. Europeans need to decide which capability mix they want to have. But of course, normally you can only decide it if you know what you actually want to be able to do. So in a way, the American pivot uh, is dependent upon a European strategy. Europeans deciding, okay, what is our level of ambition then in dealing with some of these security issues um, for which the Americans now sort of impose autonomy upon us. As a Belgian, by the way, I find it greatly irritating that we can always only be autonomous, apparently, if the Americans order us to be autonomous. Uh, but okay, if that's the way it works, that's the way. Uh, I'm happy with the result. Uh, with the result. Um, what does this mean also for the way we organize um, uh, security in a transatlantic relationship? Uh, what we saw is that in Libya, couldn't be a CSDP operation because Europeans, EU member states among themselves disagreed. So then the EU, of course, disappears. Um, then the debate shifts to NATO, but if, in NATO if the Americans say, well, we're not going to lead, we're not going to take initiative, it's up to you to decide what you want. Well, NATO minus the Americans, it's more or less the same bunch of Europeans again. So they replay the same debate and lo and behold, they still disagreed. Um, so what you get is you know, a NATO that I think more and more is an instrument, it's a tool, it's a service provider, it's a good one, it delivers very effective command and control of military operations, but it's less and less an actor in its own, in its own right. You basically have two real actors, you have Washington and you have the Europeans. If and when the Europeans concert, which they don't do often enough, but they are more likely to do it in the EU, because there they can look at the whole of foreign policy, and if and when they decide that, that foreign policy in a specific case needs a military reply, well, then we can make use of the tools that we have and we choose which one we need on an ad hoc basis. That will sometimes be NATO, if you want to do something rather large in military terms. That will sometimes be our own CSDP. That will sometimes be the United Nations. Uh, but I think more and more NATO you know, becomes an instrument, a toolbox. And for once, dare I say it, Donald Rumsfeld seems to be right. The mission defines the coalition. Um, oh, damn, this was on the record, was it? Well, there you go. Um, these are just, there are of course other debates, but these are for me the, the key questions on which we need some more 
um, strategic thinking to lead into priorities. What I would start from is to say, well, we, we don't need to throw away the strategy that we have, because I think the method, holistic, preventive, multilateral, is still very much valid. And I think in this world of today, it can still work, basically because we have multipolarity, but also interdependence. The great powers are much more interdependent than they, than they were before. Just think about you know, in economic terms, how we're all very much interlinked. I think also about some of the global challenges, which we can only uh, solve if we cooperate. It's no guarantee that we will cooperate, but we know that no great power can solve something like global warming uh, on its own. So our method, I think, is still valid, but we need to add to it interest. And interest is often in EU circles a bit of a dirty word. You know, I've sat now uh, sat in quite a few debates about um, the intervention in Libya, for example. And people say to me, well, you know, uh, Europeans intervened in Libya, but they have interest there. Therefore, it is bad. I think, well, what would you prefer then? You know, we would do interventions when it's against our interest, when we have no interest at all? I'm not quite clear. By the way, then the same people who tell you, you know, uh, evil you, you intervened in Libya, who now really criticize you for not intervening in Syria. That's another debate. Um, so I really would bring in interest, and I think what is legitimate, uh, distinctive about EU strategy is that we at least try to safeguard our interests uh, while respecting the legitimate interests of others. But this, that's what makes our strategy distinctive. It's not about being disinterested. That simply does not, uh, does not exist. Um, in our research at the Institute, we made as a list of vital interests. Of course, we need to protect our territory. We need to um, safeguard the supply of all the natural resources that we need for our economy. We need to safeguard, we need to keep open all our lines of interaction with the world, in physical as in cyberspace, global trade power. We need to manage migration. We need to um, manage climate change. I would argue that upholding the basic tenets of international law is a vital interest. And we need to preserve our autonomy. By that I mean that uh, EU member states should be able to make up their own minds and decisions should be not be made for us in uh, Beijing, Moscow or Washington uh, for that matter. And I think starting from those interests and applying the method, continuing to apply the method that we have applied, uh, it should be possible to, uh, to define some priorities. I don't think the aim of such a, an exercise strategic reflection should be to find consensus on each and every imaginable item in foreign policy, but rather to establish some priorities in which we agree, one, they're important for all 27, and two, there is added value in collective action. But then also to mandate the institutions that we have created, high representative in the External Action Service, um, to mandate them to initiate policy on our behalf. While uh, now, member states seem to use the External Action Service as a secretariat uh, of their national ministries rather than regarded as a policy actor in its own right, which has, of course, something to do with perhaps a lack of willingness within the service and at the top of it itself. Final point, a much more quick point. Um, this was the substantial debate. Then I do think the question comes, um, do we need to write this down or not? And I think once you have a strategy, you also need to sell it. And first of all, then the EU needs to sell it to its own constituency, to the public in its member states, to national parliaments. It also needs to sell it to the outside world. And therefore, I think producing some sort of strategic document would be an important instrument to provide ourselves with a new strategic narrative. You know, actors need this from time to time. The 2003 document, if you read it, everybody says, but it's still valid. Well, it's true, uh, but nobody cares about it anymore. You know, you need to refresh it from time to time. Just like NATO in 2010 reviewed its strategic concept. It doesn't say anything new or unexpected, a new one, uh, but NATO, you know, its main advantage is much shorter than the previous one and therefore readable. Um, but NATO needed to rebrand to rebrand itself and the EU needs to, needs to do the same thing. And I would say we need to write a positive document, a positively toned document. Don't start from threats and say everything is, you know, everything is going down the drain. Start from a very positive agenda. And I would say, look, we Europeans have a model that is distinctive in the world and it works better than anywhere in the world. We do democracy plus capitalism, plus strong government, or big government, as the Americans would call it. As a result of which, Europe is the most equal continent in the world. We managed to provide to the greatest share of our citizens the greatest prosperity, um, greatest freedom, and the greatest security. That's our distinctive thing. And we, ha we happen to believe that if other states would apply not the same um, model in, in all its details, but start from the same value set, that would actually be better for everybody. It would be better for their own population, but it would bring stability and therefore would be better for us. So I would start from this very, very positive 
uh, agenda and then bring in interest is because interests are the vital conditions that have to be fulfilled in order to preserve our own, our own model. They are not something that is per se, uh, per se bad. And then set out some priorities. And of course, nothing, not all of it needs to be written down in one document. So I think the end result of this can also be a tasking um, to develop more specific action plans or to, to implement some of the policies that um, some of the policies that we have. Um, what is important, and I'll end with that, is that we create some sort of follow-up mechanism. If we're not debating, continue to debate, you know, whether or not we should revise the 2003 strategy is because at the time we didn't provide for this. In 2007-8 there was an attempt to revise it, which failed, <coughs> sort of by coincidence five years later, and now uh, next year will be ten years, sort of by coincidence we're debating it again. But the fact is that people, as I know, uh, all people are very busy. So if, they are, if, if the strategy that we have is not somehow integrated and incorporated into some bureaucratic system that, for example, says that, well, for, with every new mandate of a high representative, he or she has to uh, provide for an update of the strategic thinking, then after a while people stop thinking about it because they have too much to do. And, and I, I know that um, I, I may wake up every morning and read the European security strategy and do so again before I go to bed, but normal people probably don't. Um, <laughs> Well, my students might, but only until they pass the exam. So we need to create a, a follow-up mechanism and make sure that there is ownership, which also means, I think, that we need to involve uh, all the relevant actors in the strategic thinking. So the exercise that started now, led by four member states, will be mostly uh, be a think-tanking exercise, as far as I understand. Our institute will probably be an associate partner of it. Uh, they have just informed us. Um, but at some point, it needs to involve the political actors in the member states, meaning member states governments, but for me also member states parliaments, the defense and foreign affairs committees, and of course uh, the NGOs and the academics and the think tankers. Um, it, that does sound a bit like a mini convention and why not? Because it is sort of by, by having this debate outside the normal bodies in Brussels that you can arrive at something more creative uh, and that is much more daring, but I know that in politics, courage is a difficult world. Thank you very much. Thank you.